Alrighty, folks. So I started planning out how fast we're supposed to be going, and we're going slow. So we'll see. I'll try to go a little faster today. Um, if that comes at the expense of your ability to understand the material, you know, sort of like, give me some feedback, let me know, right? Because obviously if I'm just talking to myself for an hour and a half, then that is less helpful. At the same time, of course, we are reading a book because you have the book now. Yeah, and you, you started reading the book. You started reading the book? Or so many here for so right the library. Okay. You both are reading for to right. That's okay. I just keep it fire reading. Let's go. Okay. So we're gonna really jump into that section. And of course, as you see it today, um, we're gonna start understanding what parts we really want to dig into. So of course, gonna supplement the learning. Um, and then, of course, I report all these. I don't have any views on the last class. So that's not part of um, I, I, at the end of last class, I, I made two mistakes. So first, I said that I had already introduced uh, accretion and differentiation. We hadn't done that, so we're going to take a step back and make sure we do these in the right order. And then I absolutely mix up one of the two important sources of radioactivity. And of course, it's what Garrett said. Um, and so we'll show that today. This is why you never say anything about the slide has the number. So numbers are bad. Okay. All right. So here's what we think is going on in terrestrial planets. Um, you got an inner core, you got an outer core, um, you have a convective zone, and then you have just these rocks that we stand on that are essentially icebergs in this analogy. Right? Okay. Um, so why are new planets molten, and why do they differentiate? Well, the easiest answer is because they're hot. They're very big, and so because they are large, they accumulate material, and they convert that gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. That's the form of differentiation. And, um, it gets even worse at the very beginning. So if you think about the protoplanetary disk from which all the planets form, um, these are objects that are not sitting right next to each other and mixing. So for example, there's less kinetic energy um, in this scenario. So let's say I take some surface like this, and I have this material move down, and this material move up, and that this is the radius of the Earth which is about 6,000 kilometers, that's nowhere as big as the energy that comes from accretion, where accretion, of course, would be like some object like this. This is the Earth, and this is an object, let's call it Theia. And if they are coming towards each other, that, you know what the gravitational potential energy looks like, right? U, G, of course, is proportional, let's just do this proportionally, one over R. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so we have gravitational potential energy decreases from zero to very large negative values, and that always turns into large positive values in the form of heat when you conserve energy. And then finally, you just start collecting all this radioactivity. And we'll show that different radionuclides have different lifetimes and therefore contribute heating at different points in the planetary evolution. But um, what you're going to see is that these are just, you know, thermonuclear generators at the bottom of the Earth, and they're what makes Earth hot. Okay. Okay. Um, next. Oh, yeah, this is an important one. Um, this is a really important one. Let me say this more, more carefully. If the interior is molten, then you get buoyancy. And the reason why that's important is because if you have just a typical rock, that might be a matrix of different elements uh, in groups. And even though you have a heavy group of certain elements, they're not able to move through the rock, right? Not until it's liquid again. Okay. You can kind of do that when the pressures and temperatures are high enough, pre melting. But once they're molten, it's just like it's just like mixing up oil and water, right? And I encourage you to go home and make a little dressing 
and then put lemon juice and oil and just wait. And you'll see that the lemon juice is going to separate. Okay. So let's use what we know about surface temperatures and radioactivity. Um, so I'm going to tell you that how radioactivity works really quickly. We're going to talk about the exterior of the planet. Then we're going to move all the way through the interior of the planet and figure out how big you have to be to be differentiated all the way through. Remember that the word differentiated means heavy stuff in the middle, light stuff on top. So objects that are undifferentiated would be like uh, um, cookie dough ice cream when you get it from the store. And stuff that would be differentiated would be cookie dough ice cream after you left it in the car for three hours. So then all the cookie dough melts to the bottom and all the ice cream is on top, right? Okay, that's the process of differentiation. So radioactivity occurs throughout the interior, um, but we're gonna just assume that whatever mass you have uh, is going to contribute in, uh, you know, if you have a bigger object, you use this heating rate, which is a volumetric heating rate, right? So if you have more mass of the planet, then you have more stuff that's doing radioactivity. So even though, for example, you have radioactive um, uh, radon, that's very close to the surface. I don't care if it's at the surface or if it's in the core, it's still contributing to the heating. Okay. Okay. The heating rate per gram decreases with time. Right? So there's no means to replenish rate of decayed radionuclides. So for example, radionuclides, the ones that are radioactive, they are created where? Almost. You're on the right track, but not quite. It's 89% there. You only get radioactive materials created in the explosions of stars. So the stuff that's formed in stars goes up to iron, for example. And iron is very stable. You can get some small amounts of radioactive objects, but they're rare. Most of it is made in supernova, type one or type two, rapid or slow, and that's where you get the majority of radioactive nuclei, so nuclear um, isotopes. Um, so if you can't make any new ones, then you're just stuck with whatever it was when it started to collect material, okay? Now, of course, if you get hit with something massive, um, that could add new material, but once it's mixed up, you can't tell the difference, right? Once it's done. Okay. Um, so we're going to add to it some amount of surface heat um, that comes from the sun. And we're going to find out how hot each of the planetary surfaces should be. That seem reasonable? Okay. Here's the radioactive heating rates. Um, this is the primitive stuff. Uh, and then this is the um, current stuff. Okay, and so you can see here is your major contributor. Here's your radioactive potassium. That's the same radioactivity that you get in bananas. Oh. <laughs> so bananas are heating up, no. Bananas aren't heating up in the middle of the planet, but that's how you can think of it, right? And you can see here that the contribution today is about two ergs per second per gram. And of course, if you want to stick that into uh, a calculator, you can type how much that is. And you get a really good contribution here from thorium and uranium, 238. Right? Okay, you um, certainly have some contribution from 235, which is the stuff that you find um, in your computer, but it's not anywhere as important as acid. But of course, if you look backwards in time, you'll see that you have this contribution here from aluminum, you have this from chlorine and iron. Um, notice that I said iron was stable, and I gave you an unstable version of iron. Well, that's because, of course, this iron um, has a very quick half-life, 2.6 million years. So you don't find this iron in rocks today, right? Or it's rare. <laughs> Um, and of course, there is a, if you've taken quantum mechanics, you'll know that there is an inverse relationship between the half life and the energy that you get. 
but very quick, very unstable reactions only to give you one energy. And you can kind of see that. Um, not perfect, but it's close. Um, so what you see here is uh, this is the original heating, like when it first came together. These were kind of um, lesser parts. And of course, the iron, um, chlorine, and kind of aluminum contrib contributions were much greater. Okay, you can also tell here that the um, uh, heating rate was about uh, 10 to the 6 larger. 10 to the 6 is what number? 100,000. Is it? 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6 is a million. 10 to the 3 is? 1,000. 10 to the 5 is? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. We're just going to memorize those. All right, so let's consider the surface temperature of a spherical planet. We're going to assume that it has a mass m and radius r. Okay, we're going to assume that it's a solar system composition at a distance r, little r, from the sun, the luminosity l. So the power in, that is the sunlight and radioactive heating, has to be equal to the power out in order for it to be a black body. I mean, this is the contribution of black body radiation. And those two things that we just talked about, that's the surface heating from the sun, and also the heat that is going to be emanated from the fact that it is a radioactive object. Okay? So this here is just the luminosity divided by 4 pi r. That's the luminosity over an area. Okay? This little r is how far away you are. So that is the flux drop off as a function of the inverse square law from the sun. And then I just have a cross section, pi r squared. So assume that the Earth is a little disk. That's, of course, not a good approximation, but that's the first approximation. Now, really, what you want to do is you want to calculate what a half semicircle would be or a half sphere, but we're not going to do that. It's a factor of two, right? Or pi r squared versus four pi. Okay. That first piece, okay? Sun? Can you drive that in your head? Let's do it really quickly. Okay. Luminosity. Let's say this is our sun, really good sun, amazing sun, good drawing with hair, I've always. Okay. Sun, <laughs> sun puts out the um, same amount of light, no matter what. But it decreases as you go away. So let's think about L as the luminosity. And how does it decrease? Well, as I go from this point, for this point, I'm going to make two really perfect circles here. And you all think, wow, these are such good circles. Were you supposed to be an artist? Um, and no, I wasn't. Okay. And then notice this bigger circle. Right? So according to conservation laws, the total amount hasn't changed. So I can relate these two spheres, of course, by how much material is getting out to that larger sphere. So I can always just say that L divided by the surface area of whatever surface intersects my object. And that would be up here for pi little r. Sorry. Simple? Okay. Um, so that's the first part. The second part I already explained. And the third part, oh, that looks tricky. What's that? Yeah, do you have it? The third yes. part. What? Take gas lot. This one here. This one here is just for black body radiation. Um, and the only the only hint you have here is this bad boy. So that sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So this is the Stefan Boltzmann law. And what this does is it allows us to convert between the luminosity or the amount of light that we get from an object. And we can relate it to its temperature and its size. So if it's a small thing, then it must be really hot. If it's a hot thing, 
um, for a given size, then you can you know figure out how much light is coming off of it, and vice versa. Right? Okay. So this is what we want to find. We want to find what the temperature the Earth is shining at based on our two inputs. So this is the contribution from the sun. This is the contribution from um, the radiation. And now I can just do some fancy dancy algebra. And uh, you got TS. Okay. And of course, you can adjust these at any time. So if, for example, I wanted to be very careful, right? I would say not just big L, maybe I do L star. And I'd add a little um, circle with a dot to show that it's the luminosity of the sun. But I could change that to be like twice the luminosity now. Because of course, the luminosity was factored larger by about a factor two and a half at the start of the solar system. And it's kind of become less um, bright. Okay. Um, but the radiation, of course, is larger by a factor of a million. Right? We saw that in 10 to the 6. So we can find out how hot the Earth must have been. Okay, and here's the key results. And we're going to make some assumptions, of course, here. We haven't talked about atmosphere, so you have no idea what they are. Okay. And um, if you just calculate it for now, you see that Venus is a very comfortable 327 Kelvin. So, like, that's pretty good, actually. Right? It's a little cold. But it's pretty good. Um, Mercury, okay, it's a little warm. It's a little warm. And uh, the moon is 278. Oh, the moon's like too cold. And that's actually not surprising. Right? And of course, it's too cold. And the moon is a great example of this because there is no atmosphere. Is there an atmosphere in Mercury? Just to find out. All right. Um, and if we compare these to uh, the start of the solar system, you see that, of course, they were much hotter. So Venus, of course, um, is about 1,000 Kelvin. And we can compare this to the melting points of planetary rocks. So we said that this is sort of the, the temperature range for silicate rocks. So iron may not be melting at the surface. Um, right? These are you know, broad assumptions about the average state. But certainly the silicate rocks are melting, right? OK. Um, mercury, OK, uh, you know, probably melting a lot of the silicate rocks as well. Moon, maybe not so obvious whether it's doing all of that, right? OK. Um, we haven't learned how to calculate the interior temperatures, but what this is telling us is just at the surface, you have molt, right? It's molten, magma oceans. So if you think about what the surface of the Earth will look like 4.5 billion years ago, it was a lava, no land, anything, right? And of course, that should beg the question, where did the water come We'll get to that later. Okay, so Venus is certainly molten all the way through, probably Mercury too, as we'll show. Okay. Oh, what the front door? That is very unhelpful. Don't know why I did that. All right. Wait, we did that, right? Okay. Uh, so I just brought this slide back up, and of course I changed this to reflect the fact that you hadn't seen it. So now we've talked about it. So um, here's the here's the radioactive heating rate um, that's relevant for planetary interiors today. So it looks something like this, and then this is the value from uh, 4.6 billion years ago. Is that reasonable? I know these numbers don't necessarily mean anything to you, but the important thing to keep in mind is they are rates, so they're energy per unit time, so it's a power per unit mass. So you're always multiplying these by the mass of the material. Because we don't care how it's distributed, we just care that it's there. Okay. All right. Math. Everyone away. All right. You have your notes. Let's imagine that we are going to do some calculus, and we all know how to do calculus, and we don't hate it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so let's consider the power dq generated inside a spherically symmetric object. So we want to imagine, and even though it's spherically symmetric, I am not going to draw a sphere because you just saw how good I was at that. Okay? So here's the interior, and this thing is going to be our little r. Okay? And this thing here is our dr. 
Is that okay? All right. So what we want to know is the heat generated within this, right? What's this? What's this stuff in here? And that's going to be d q, not very. Right. Well, that's not hard to do if you just want to think about it in terms of radioactivity, right? Because obviously you're not getting anything from the sun when it's inside of the body. So we just need to look at the heating rate times the mass, right? And that's what we say here. We say, what's the heating rate? That's big upside down V or lambda, capital lambda, right? times dm. And how do we find dm? Well, if we assume, and this is an unfair assumption, that the radi that the density is constant, then the mass is always equal to, let's just write this up here, the mass is equal to how, what relationship between density and volume? That's a time volume, good. Because we're going to, of course, have all of these. What's the relationship between density, mass, and volume? Mass divided by volume. Good. And the last one? Mass over density. Very good. Hey, you have those memorized, right? Your third years, fourth years. All right, so that means that I just need to define this, V. But if it's dm, then it should be dv. And in fact, the way that we write this is 4 pi r squared dr. That is how you write dv. C'est bon? Cool. Okay, and now I have a differential unit. Oh, I can take the dr over, and I have dq dr is that, right? which is great, because even though I made an assumption that rho was constant, now I have something that can vary with r, because everything having to do with r is on the one side and dq dr is on the other side. So as long as there's not too much change within this little slice, it's a perfectly good approximation. Because at every single layer, I can just say, okay, well, the interior has this value, and then the core has this value, and the upper mantle has that value, right? Then I just integrate. Okay? Everything fine? Okay, so now we need to um, use boundary conditions and think about how uh, temperature is actually going to move through this object, right? So here we have the QDR. What is this thing inside of here? What is the little FD? What? What frequency would be valid here? We haven't really talked about them, right? So, yeah. We're not even really thinking about like that. What's that? Uh, what do we mean, mean by temperature? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's clearly some keys here that's indicating that it's probably T like. So this looks like a 4 pi r squared is a surface area, right? Okay. And this is a Flux, flux temperature. So what I'm asking is, what is the rate of change as a function of radius of the flux temperature through the surface area? Does that make sense? And thankfully, we already can calculate that. Um, so that is just given by the rate of change of the temperature times this little bad boy, and that's the definition of our. Um, Anyway, you just have a couple we wanted to get. <laughs> but what this allows us to do is to write instead of dq, we can write it as dt. 
the TDF. So now we can measure the temperature at every location, just as long as we can write this on the right hand side. And I know that you love derivatives, so you can do that at home if you want, or you can code that out. Okay, strictly symmetric, so I don't care what direction you choose. Is that fair? You know what I'm lost by this? A little bit? Cool. Okay, so this we calculated from the definition of dq. And this we're saying that if the temperature is constant, as much heat must flow out of the shell as is generated there. Right? So unless the thing's allowed to go to infinity, right? It's not changing, the temperature is constant. Okay, then you can write it like this, dq. Yeah. Is that Um, to solve differential equations, we need boundary values. So what are the two boundaries to consider in this one-dimensional differential equation? I know you're reading this one for the answer. I just need you to listen to the words. What are the boundaries in this one differential equation that relates temperature as a function of radius to some constants? The interior. This is from the core. Uh, is what the R is, yeah? But what are the boundaries? What? So it's one dimensional. I don't know anything about pies. That I'm like, oh, what surface? Core to surface. The interior, the very, very middle R equals zero to the exterior R, big R, whatever you think that is. That's the boundary, right? We have to be able to, to recognize the boundary. Okay, and just to remember here, I wrote put this up. Um, you need as many boundary conditions as there are orders in the differential equation. So, what is the first order differential equation? Well, it's when you see dx, for example, and there's no two on it. Right. So, a partial first order would have our funny little friend, which looks like this. So these are first order, right? And these are second, and so on and so forth. Cool. So um, that differential equation we can solve for as long as we have the mass of the object, the prescription for the density, the heating rate, and the thermal conductivity. Um, you need two boundary conditions. What's the um, exterior boundary condition? What's the exterior round condition for function? Did you already calculate that in the class? Yeah. Yes, you did. It's right here. It's one of the first things we did today. Okay. So we say that the power in from sunlight and radiation must be equal to the power out. That's your, that's your boundary condition. Okay. Right at the surface. 
So we already got it, right? That's the exterior of energy condition of temperature. Okay. The interior boundary condition is less uh, less helpful. Um, it's just that it has to be finite. <laughs> okay, so it can't be infinite. It can't be negative number. Okay, you'll notice this looks a little different. That's okay. Um, it has an albedo here and emissivity. I'm gonna go ahead and let you know that right now. Okay. You don't have to go with all of the light. That would be part of your L. Okay. Okay. So we can do this. Um, we have the total radioactive heating power from the mass, and we have that heating rate, uh, lambda, and we know the sun, we know how far away the planet is, we know how big the planet is. Um, we got all the pieces here. So we, we get the boundary condition. We get that the central temperature is finite. So you just start at the boundary and you work towards the other one, right? And you can do that with a computer, of course. Oh, no. Um, but you can also do it like this. Um, you can assume that thermal conductivity is independent of temperature. So you just integrate the Poisson equation twice. And you apply the boundary conditions at those boundaries. So if, for example, you remember the original equation, so back, here it is, one over R squared dr. Well, I just want to start with that exterior dr. I'm going to multiply the R squared over, and then I'm going to integrate both sides. Okay, so what's the integral of R squared? Good. Yeah, ready to go. There it is, right? All right, so now I got an R squared on one side and an R on the other. So now what do I do? Just divide. Okay. And then I'm going to do it again for T. And I'm going to apply the boundary condition for each. Okay. So there it is. Um, C is, of course, a constant. So it falls outside of the integration. So it's dr squared. Uh, so sorry, I should say it properly. Um, the second one is the integral of one over r squared, and that is negative one over r. Good. And what is the integral of r? Very good, r squared. And what is the integral of t d, dt over dr times dr? T. So this is just uh, some fancy schmancy algebra. Dt dr dr. So this is, of course, the integral of dt, which is t. Okay. All right. So now we have some important constants. So let's see how this thing behaves. So let's treat this thing um, for r and zero. Is the thing finite at r equals zero? This thing here, finite for r equals The first term is zero at r equals zero. D is d at r equals zero. So that's great. As long as we don't choose an infinite constant, which is great. Oh, what about this one? Right, it's not finite, right? It's infinite. So the only way for this to be finite is for C to be zero, right? Because if it is, if C is zero, then that term will double blow. Right? Okay, good. That's the first. Thing. And then of course we have to uh, use at, at R equals the big R that value that we had for TS. Okay, so this is what D is. I just add that in. So now I have it. So TR is the temperature at the surface plus some value 
that gets bigger as you go down. You'll notice here that this contribution R squared minus little r squared is zero at the surface, right? And it's maximum nature. That does everything we hope it does, right? Okay. So boom, we've just modeled the interior of planets. <clears throat> so let's try. All right. Taking density to be just very average. Uh, and you use the heating rate for carbonaceous conduits today and the thermal conductivity for silicate. Just assume the whole thing is silicate. They're only talking about terrestrial rocks. Um, these are the bodies you get. And remember, at each one of these steps, you're making an approximation. So our expectation of the interior should not be like, oh, we nailed it. It's like, oh, the first order, that's correct. Okay. So here we have the Earth. Orbital radius one. Good. Max big, radius big, albedo small, but more reflective than the moon. Cool. Temperature at the surface, bomb, beautiful, right? Is that the current temperature? What? Probably not. In fact, it's not the temperature at all. What's wrong? Excuse me? Close. Yeah, we have air. Yeah, so we have an atmosphere. That makes this planet habitable, right? Nothing lives on the moon. It's too cold. All right. Um, there's the moon. Um, and here's the interior. So this is very hot. This is very hot. In fact, this is uh, probably greater than the you know the temperature for iron is like eighteen hundred degrees Kelvin. So this would claim this back in the envelope calculation would claim that the moon was melted all the way through. That's probably not exactly right, and we know that because we seismometer the moon, we watch earthquakes on the moon, we can tell the interior structure. But it's about right for Vesta. The Vesta, of course, is very small, only two hundred and sixty-five kilometers. Okay, and it's small. And so, do you think that Vesta is differentiated? Okay, what is differentiated mean again? What property of cookie dough ice cream is differentiated? Cookie dough ice cream. I think of the word differentiated as cookie dough ice cream. Right. When you buy it from the store, they're all mixed. Yummy, delicious. And then every bite is tasty. You leave it in your car, and all the cookie dough sinks to the bottom, and you refreeze it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's differentiation. Okay. Okay. So that's the differentiated. What's that? Well, this is only with the now values, right? So these values here we use for the eating rates today. Okay. Um, so this is the interior of today, right? Each body is considered uniform density. That's not true. Um, when they exceed about 2,000 degrees, that probably overestimates because, of course, the diffusivity changes linearly, and diffusion is not the only form of heat transport. Okay? Convection is important, too, particularly when it does become liquid. Right? Examples of convection are... All my analogies are good. Well, now what? <laughs> miso. You ready? Miso soup. And you can see the convective cells. So if, when you look at boiling water, that doesn't really show. I mean, it is it is certainly convective, right? It's heating from below and it's downward. But you can't see the cell structure. When you have miso, you can see the cell structure, and you can see that it's the same cells that you see in the sun. Okay. So that was, sorry, this is the Earth, right? Going through 270, it's hot, real quick. Melt me up some rocks, good. And then the moon, and then Vesta, and of course, keep in mind, this is the log scale. Cool. Okay, so if the Earth weren't already differentiated today, it would become differentiated quickly, right? 
Again, those were current meteors. Similarly, if the moon has any liquid metal in its core, it's just barely liquid. Because we did say that those that 20, 2800, if you think the 500, that's probably an overestimation of heat. And like we just said, just a solid through and through. And it's probably been solid for a long time. Notice that I said the word solid, not the word differentiate. Uh, wait, not that. Come on. Okay, so let's look at the um, uh, earlier times. So at the time of calcium aluminum and fusion formation, this is like the oldest piece of rock that we found in, are these calcium fusion um, inclusions. Um, so the radioactive heating power and the solar luminosity were these values. So this just increases the solar luminosity by uh, 2.5, and um, that's going to make the surface warmer. And over here, we're going to jack up the heating rate from radioactivity by about a factor of a million. Right? So the interior is a million times hotter. The surface is about two and a half times, perhaps. And if you think about a small uniform sphere, can't think about anything that has holes in it, because that's not how we did our diffusion. We assumed everything would be contact and similar within uh, each sphere. I guess it went out, but EQ. Um, you can look at an object like Ceres. So Ceres is the biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Um, oh, by the way, I should point out there's like one series, and that's the convention for all asteroids that are named. And you always do their name. With the number in front of it. So four Vesta is not like a four Vesta. It's like that's the asteroid designation four. And when we see really, really big numbers, that just means they're found later. Okay. In fact, things like Ceres and Vesta, right, those were found like very early on. They're big. If you have telescopes, you look at them. And then other stuff is done more recently with more, more modern telescopes. Okay, so let's um, let's throw some numbers in there. Ceres um, it has a carbonaceous chondrite. So the, what was the density of rocks again? Okay. Yeah, three point five is good. So you know maybe this is like less dense than for the silicate rocks we were looking at before. But that's fine. They're more carbon based, silicon, carbon, whatever. Um, very low albedo, 5% reflectivity, um, and uh, it's farther than the Earth, so it's receiving less light, right? Okay, and so it's just barely massive enough that minerals melt in its center. So if we use T0, or we, we use that earlier one, we find that T0 is 1,200 degrees, right? Um, this is what it looks like. So you can solve for R. You can see um, what the interior structure looks like um, for a given mass at a given temperature. You can find that uh, non-porous bodies as, as small as a few kilometers in size melt in their interior at the very beginning. So if you can form early enough, and this is a really important one, if they form early enough in the solar system's history, you can get to a kilometer, then you can melt your interior. Because even though we see something that's today a kilometer size, it doesn't mean that enough of that mass was together when the heating rates, the interior heating rates were high enough. Right? If you just have, let's say, some small grains and they're really radioactive very early on, great. No, we're flaming up. <laughs> awesome. But they may not go into melting any of the objects, right? Unless they're all together. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, so this is essentially how we can use all of this information to find out what the smallest bodies are, right? And how we can think about how heat is transported in the interior with diffusion. Okay. So now let's talk about rocks.
<laughs> What's that? A rock. Very good. What's the rock? Don't read. Don't read. What kind of rock? What? I feel good. It's a moon rock. It's a moon rock. What's the name of the boulder from the moon? That's not my photo, obviously. Um, and then the ones here are it's an uh, uh, similar north of site boulder, but from the earth. So you can tell, of course, because why can you tell? It's not here. The atmosphere, good. And what else? I guess the green. The green, yeah, that's good. And the sign. The sign of the dead giveaway. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Is this on the no, it's not. Right? We took it home. It's like a souvenir. Okay. Oh, I didn't think we'd get this far. Um, here's what I want to try. I mean, we have like 30 minutes. It's pretty good. We're ahead of schedule now. I went too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna attempt to get somewhere in between there. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about um thermodynamics if we want to at the end of the the rocks and petrology part, because honestly, I'm just gonna fuck up a lot of minerals and Kara's gonna be like, nope, that's not right. <laughs> so um, for the most part, we're gonna think about them in terms of composition, because of course, composition is the thing that we can measure. So how do we measure rock composition, for example, from a distance? We were able to get rocks from the moon, and that's really helpful. So we can talk a lot about the lunar rocks, but for example, we have never gotten a rock back from Venus, right? And we'll talk about why that is later on. We, what? It's too hot. Yeah, it's too hot. It's also really hard to get off, right? So for example, it's very comparable in size to the Earth. Um, so you would need a rocket as big as the ones that we launch off the Earth, right? Really easy to get off the moon, even small, small rocket necessary. Um, we're trying to get rocks from Mars. We're trying to go pick up the samples, but we already have Mars rocks. And I'll tell you how that happens too. Okay, so we'll talk about the composition of these bodies. We'll talk about how they inform, interestingly enough, ancient atmospheres when we get to that section. But in order to do that, we need to talk about the common minerals that we find. We need to talk about how trace elements lead to radioisotope dating. And then we'll talk about the age of the moon rocks as a way to um, identify some theories about the age of these objects, right? What formed first? Did the Earth form first? Did the moon form first, et cetera? Right? Well, they weren't, they formed at the same time? Strange, right? Okay. Uh, ignore this red thing that's gonna come up, it's not true. <laughs> okay. um, oh, just for homework, um, we will do like three problems. So is it going to be available at least by next week? No, it'll, it'll be on Thursday. Homer comes out on Thursday. I just didn't think I'd get this slide. <laughs> I went much faster than I thought. Okay. Okay. I know, that's why I said ignore it. <laughs> but I haven't written it yet. Relax. No rough to it. Okay. Oh, look, I didn't even fix this. Oh my god, this is disrespectful. Um, okay. here's your silicates. What are silicates? Not fair. Yeah, silicon and <laughs> silicate, they have similar words in there, right? So the word silica comes from Do they? Yeah, what's that? Yay! Elements! What's this? Magnesium. Good! What's that one? Oxygen. Woo! What's this? Oh, shit. <laughs> That's it? Four strike. You will not need to know anything other than this one. Very close. All the beam. Okay? What's this one? Very close. What's that? Peroxies. Yeah. Jellies are stupid. Don't oh, hear it for a second, okay? They have this club. It's called LPSC. 
Okay, Final Rio Club is a giant conference, and uh, we have a poster session, and it's the best poster session you go to any scientific conference because geologists know how to park. They're really good at it, like professionals. Okay, um, but in their stupid little rock club, they just decide every. They're just like, okay, this is the name of a rock, and you all should know it. So I went to this like the uh, tenth International Mars conference, and they were just throwing around rocks. Like they were nothing. I was like, how do you know all these rock names? There's just millions of rocks. Instead of just being like, hey, if you just show me that. I mean, yes, that is horrifying. I wouldn't want to ever try to say that. But like when we talk about the atmosphere, we don't like name H2O. I guess we call it water. Um, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, we call it carbon dioxide, right? Yeah. That's it. Oh, you have one name. You have, you have water, and that's it. But like oh wait, you don't name anything else, and you're just like nope, we're gonna name everything. So anyway, that's my that's my uh, one problem with geology, and I'll try my best. But if I say something is an ensotite and, and it's not, <laughs> okay. So you have two major groups here. You'll notice that these are the most abundant silicates, so that they all have. What? Silicon. Right? Yeah, the oxygen in there too, but that's not the most important part. Right? Either the silicon. Okay. Um, lots of ma uh lots of magnesium, lots of iron, right? Sometimes they like to, to be together, sometimes they like to be with their friend calcium, right? Okay. What's the difference between these two groups? See how I said that? Monosilicates and bisilicates. Yeah. It's the second one like iron. Excuse me? It's the second one like the it's so iron. It's like fire. <laughs> uh, no, that gets on fire easier. That's a very good question. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, the two here, see this kind of cool group of these two. The two, and this one, you know, uh, it's kind of an imposter, right? If you can get rid of the silicon, you can add aluminum instead. All right, cool. Okay, so these are the abundant ones. Um, I have uh, some classifications here. <sighs> That's a weird word. How do you say that? What? Close. Lofty. Nope. Oh. Mayfit, very good. And what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what does Mayfit mean, Garrett? Yeah. Does it have magnesium and iron? Right? And so I like to look at the word Mayfit, Mayfit, and think magnesium ferric, magnesium iron, right? Because, of, of course, ferrous items are. Irons, right? Ferrofluid, etc. May fit. Good. That one might like, remember. So we're gonna remember all of you is may fit. Oh, now we're talking about geologists. Okay, what's the next one? Here's examples. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I can have one of those. You have one of these? Yeah. This is my favorite one. Why, why is this my favorite one? And, and, and it's uh, the only one that's like you have to remember it. This guy for me in it. It's fucking sick, bro. It looks like monsters. It's rock. Right? But you can't tell the resolution. It's, like, <laughs> it's special rock. Yeah. It's the LG Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a problem. Problem. I don't know where I got these. Oh, it's from there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, fuck. These moments suck. All right. What do we got here? Excuse me? Yeah. Felt's probably very good. And what's special about them? Good. Remember, I said these are all silicates, so I hope so. <laughs> ah, trisilicates. Very good. Okay. And there's two different groups here. How do you say that? Orthoclase. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Incorrect, but I like it. What's the second one? Plagioclase. Okay. 
So um, the first one is fourth effect. You got that one right. Boss I think is here. I think it's funny. Um, and then the second one. Flagging. You going to say flagging. We're not going to. <laughs> we're probably never going to mention each other, but you do need to tell them. Okay. Just kidding. We're going to say, I'm going to say it in, in passing. And he's like, what the fuck? Um, because these, of course, these compositions, their relative locations and positions will tell us about the compositional history of the object. So if you talk to a geologist and they say, look at the outcrop and they, you know, see some minerals, they can tell you how that thing formed. So similarly, when we look at the surface of planets and we see minerals on the surface, that tells you about the conditions or the modifications that must have occurred, right? So that stuff either was created deep in the interior and brought up, or it was excised by impact crater. And you can see the stratification. Oh, there's layering. That's an old layer. Okay. Um, what's this? Silica. Good. Everyone knows how to say that one. What's special about it? Silica. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty important. You might even have a, a, a table at your house. What is it called? A counter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quartz counter, right? What's this one? What does that mean? What? A garden? Ooh. Yeah, now we're getting into the right? That's only reason to do science. <laughs> okay. Um, these are not really silicates, they're different. Right? Yeah. We'll talk about that in the Okay, so here is remember we talked about mafic? And what was mafic again? Good. So what's spell set? Well, so notice that the fells part is part here. Yeah. What's the felting material here? <laughs> it, it's really just a felt spark. It's felt spark. It's like an end of the two things. Really bad. Okay. Yep. What else do we got here? Here's the pretty pictures. Here's the silica. That's the quartz. I mean, of course, this is a very. It's not really important. Oh, okay. Practice. Is that what you're saying? This one? I was about to speak. I played, but like, it's, it's not hard. hard. It's not hard. No, this is hard. Big bonus. Um, I'm sure you can find version of it, right? That's formed under different conditions. Okay, and here's your spinels down here. And in your work class and the body plate, and then you get like color difference here. And we'll see that. Um, if we look, for example, um, uh, at the leaning off sort of towards the end of it. Okay. Question before we go on? All right. Whew. Look at that. Minerals. All right. So here's how you structure your silicates. Right? So it's this way. That's a heat That's a heat Not good. All right. So, of course, um, these chemical compositions uh, can be formed in matrices. And if you're taking solid state or you plan to take solid state, of course, you understand how you can do that um, on purpose to structure them however you want. But nature has a way of doing it as well. Um, so, you have your olivines, pyroxenes, and this is how they are structured. You know which of these two colors is actually. Right. Okay. Very good. Well, it's not that they both have it, right? So they both do have oxygen as well. But you can count the oxygens. Four oxygen. And if you really like that stuff, we can go into some detail about the crystal structure, right? How that, how the inclusion of these minerals um, allows, or sorry, how the inclusion of these elements into the minerals um, can give us more information. 
we're basically getting to this when we get into the trade activity. Because all of this basically is the that's a polite way in doing bias. Okay. Here's some of the fun things you can do. So you can talk about igneous rocks and what they're made of. What is igneous? What? Yeah, it kind of looks like the word ignite, right? Volcano, sure. Yeah. So we have here two different types of igneous rocks. We have volcanic rocks that are extrusive. That means that they. They come to the outside good. And we have plutonic. Like inside. Uh -huh. And interestingly enough, here, right? Volcanic and plutonic. What does this word seem like? Pluto. Why is that? It doesn't seem like Pluto, right? What is this Pluto from? Mythology and what happens in this Pluto mythology? What is Pluto in mythological terms? Ah, so what is the Greek name for Pluto? <laughs> ah, okay. It is Hades. Does that help? What is it? <laughs> God of the underworld, of course. So of course, Hades or Pluto. The god of the underworld would have intrusive rocks. Oh, excuse me. What do you mean in No, like it's up here. Yeah, like like okay, and then, and let me demonstrate this for a moment, right? So you know we're all wishing that we were in Hawaii. Every single one of us is thinking this process, and we should be in Hawaii doing a field trip looking for basaltic rock. So where would I go looking for basaltic rocks in Hawaii? Where? Inside the volcano? Outside. Where? Where? Yeah, we're doing that, right? Good. And what color is going to look Boom! Right? Cool. We already know that. <laughs> right? We're tapping into the fact that we can use these to understand the rocks themselves. Now, you might have heard the word basalt. You may not have heard, like, what's this one? And this side? Close, close. What was it? That's that. And a site, right now. And a site with no second team. Okay. That's the only difference. Yeah, it's hard. Okay. And the last one? Um, and you'll notice here that we talked about these pure scenes and project place before, right? These are the types of things that make up the salts. So when we're, when we're talking about rocks, they are a combination of minerals, right? You don't have one giant, not often, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have one rock that's all a certain object. It's like the silica that we saw earlier. <laughs> of course, that's a giant piece, or garnets tend to be very uniform. But mostly you have some mixture of these rocks, right? So this is why we're going to use like mafic minerals in our andesite, uh, you place in all three of them. Um, but rhyolite might have some quartz, and that might make it look prettier. Okay, so these are the ones that come out. And these are the ones that are supposed to be in. But of course, we know about them, so they can't possibly be in, right? So one of the greatest examples is granite. Right? Where have you seen granite before? And not just on your counter. Like, yeah. <laughs> Incorrect. Not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> All right, where do you find granite? No, a, an actual location that you've been to or you know is exists. Not caves arbitrarily. You haven't been to caves. You've been to which? Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Okay, so you're saying there is granite Grand Canyon. A very famous group of Grand Canyon. <laughs> There's a very famous group of very tall rocks in California. Yeah. 
No, no, this is a big thing. Big thing. You know what I'm thinking? Okay. Trying to guess what I'm thinking? Okay, that's perfectly fine. I was going to say Yosemite. So Yosemite, um, great example of plutonic granitic rocks. And the reason why people like granite, if you're a climber, is because it is solid as fuck. Okay? You do not want to, you know, put your protection in, and then it's a little crumbly piece of shit rock that comes right back out right when you fall in it. You want it to stay. So people love climbing on granite. Yeah, these are really hard. And they come from the interior of the planet. So how did they get there? Yeah. Did God put them there as a test? To see if we can climb? Yes, that's not. <laughs> okay, um, another great example is in Colorado. And if you don't know the Colorado geography, then this is really not going to make any sense to you. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, do you know how the rock piece was? We're going to change the couple lectures later on, but. There are volcanoes, but that's not how the rock is supposed to be. It's because of the water. So the water in the in tectonics, so remember water is just like a fraction of the Earth's surface. So that does things like erosion and that does things like weathering. But these rocks, they're intrusive. So they form where? Inside the planet. Good. And then they come to the surface. So that's already telling you about their formation mechanism. So actually, they are just moving up. Imagine that you make some really delicious iced coffee, okay? And here's how you do it. <laughs> you throw some ice down, okay? And it sticks to the metal edge of your cup, and you pour water over, or like your milk, it fills up with milk, and then you pour coffee on top. And you have these hard rocks that are at the bottom, but they're frozen to the surface. And then they come flying up once they detach from the edges. Okay? So these are just lighter. And so they rise. Remember that what we're standing on right now, the continental crust, is lighter or heavier than oceanic crust. What's that? Light. So we are literally just sitting on a rock iceberg on top of a magma ocean. Right? I say this all the time. Now, of course, that picture that we started off with today has got a lot of processes on there. And that's, a, of course, a cartoon, so it's it's oversimplified. But that's the most basic way to begin to understand how these minerals form, rise to the surface, punch through whatever crust is already there. So if you know the Colorado Rockies, for example, very large mountainous area, lots of granite evolved there. But in Boulder, you know, this was once sedimentary rock, layers and layers of sandstone. And in order to get through, you just punch through. So you have these beautiful sandstone sheets that are just fully vertical. And of course, they're being supported by giant granite um, peaks right behind them. Does that make sense? So this is how we can begin to use mineralogy and composition to immediately tell us history, right? Not even before we grab a piece of rock and taste it and find out how old it is. Right. Cool. This section easier or harder than the calculus? <laughs> easier? All right, Jim. All right, like, it's gonna be more calculus. Then. I, was, I thought this would be the worst part. Okay, maybe I'm just really bad at geology. Okay, so what's this? Rock. Rock. Very good. What's this? Scraps. Not all of you. Good. So this is a basalt, and these are really cool basalts. You can actually find them here in California. Um, what's happening here? You know? They're what? Sheeted. They're sheeted, which would mean? Yeah, there's layering in here, sure. And what is what is this formed from? Here's the hint. Basalt. Can I explain here? 
it's a it's very expensive. So the tools and the base for the part of the the new software that we will just keep our certification for that. So maybe the more, and I should have grabbed pictures of this for Iceland. Iceland has wonderful examples of this, right? All like beautifully structured hexagonal crystals and stuff like that. But we can go with this one. So like, and I did the rest. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, I'm glad for I was it's so funny. Anyway, black sand beaches, black sand beaches are made of not granite. Sorry, I'm pointing at granite. I'm gonna say that shit. <laughs> are they made up? Salt. The salt. Very good. Okay. And of course, they are um, volcanic beaches, right? So they're they're dirt, which is just ground down rocks. The most annoying thing for you to remember, or that you should take away from this class, is everything is rocks, right? So like sand is rocks. Um, uh, rocks are rocks, and dust is rocks, mostly except for a lot of human skin. Right, but like all these sizes that we think about, whether they're boulders, whether they're mountains, it's just size modification, right? So, uh, I mean, obviously, chair is one of those, but yeah, you know what? Refine, so we're just going right? Yeah, of course, yeah, but it's not, it's not the type that we're gonna see over here on the, on the screen, okay? Um, good. Here's a piece of quartz inside the granite. And uh, some of the cool things that you can see here is the way that um, it has inclusions, right? So like different groups of minerals are within the matrix of the entire rock, right? And of course, I talked about calcium aluminum inclusion before. We'll still show some pictures of those, but those are very simple. You just have this little piece of the mineral that formed and then was added to the rock at large. I don't know how you would possibly ever know that that was plastic place, but now you do. <laughs> I'm sure Jared did right away. Um, again, I didn't do that myself. The notes weren't there. I would not know. The only one I would get is the one Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about mineral densities really quickly. So, of course, they talked about the fact that something like granite floats, right? What was granite made of? Just showed you. Like just showed you. Quartz. Quartz. Magic place. What's the third one? What was it? I don't know. I wasn't looking. Yeah, let's try it again. Ah, there it is, right? And remember, it's these three colors here, right? Just for example. I mean, there's probably more minerals in there that I didn't point out. So let's look at the weight. Where are they? Here. I think you're allowed to be covered for it. Gerbertines? Here's the Gerbertines? All the treasures? And they have a range. Between 3.2 to that very light rises, heavy sink, <laughs> more or less. Cool. Okay. Um, generally speaking, here's how we can um use some of this density information to understand the composition of bodies we see without being able to go inside of them. So notice here what I said about the felsic minerals and the mafic minerals. So let's imagine that I look at some body and I see a lot of um, feldspars on the surface. Am I surprised? Not here. Why not? they're light, right? These feldspars are all on the surface. They're light. Good. If I look at a body and I see like 50% um, like quartz and 50% olivine on the surface, 
What do you think happened there? Again. 50% quartz, that's up here, and 50% phyllite. What? What's right in the middle? Remember, I'm asking about what happened to it. Is this a body that can exist in nature? Yes, it can. It just needs to be. What's that? Sure. Or a different way of saying mixed would be undifferentiated. Right? It never got the opportunity to have those heavy stuff sink. So it could never have molten. Right? And usually that means it's small. Right? So if you grab some little rock that's floating around in space. It very easily could have these equal mixtures, right? Because it just is whatever was there. Okay, it doesn't. Okay, um, that was not so painful. I hope, maybe just for me, because um, I'm really bad at rocks. Um, so for Thursday's class, I will present uh, the homework and. Um, we will finish up this discussion of rocks and mineralogy and try and start applying it to some of the bodies. So you'll see, we'll start applying it to the moon and to Mars. Um, and then finally to Venus, sorry, moon and Mercury will go first because they don't have atmospheres to complicate any of it. And then we'll talk about um, uh, moon, Earth and Venus. Okay. Okay, thanks for coming folks.